So just so we all know, um, a brief outline. Well, disclaimer, this is going to be recorded. Only the introduction and then the talk. So the QA session, feel free to ask whatever's on your mind uh, and posterity will not know it. Um, let's see. So this is our kind of sequence of events. We'll go through a little bit of PR, an introduction, and then our QA. So what is the uh, ACSYCC, the Younger Chemist Committee. So the idea is to help uh, engage and connect younger chemists and integrate them into um, the system of ACS and further develop their careers. So thank you all so much for being here to do that with us. What is the EUSYCC? So the EUSYCC is a participating collection of Eastern United States uh, and more, uh, just a different partnership uh, to help with that networking and integration aspect. Portrayed here and shown here as well. And in 2021, uh, EUSYCC received the ACS Chem Luminary Awards uh, for the Stay in Life series. So congratulations to uh, you and to us and to the organization. So thank you for your support. What are the benefits of being in the ACS? Well, you get career development and networking opportunities listed here. Aside from that, there's also more benefits uh, of different groups and subcommittees. So you're able to, I really like this, find your community wherever you go uh, and by whatever interest uh, is particularly relevant to you. So technical or uh, different affiliations. The last uh, major benefit here with ACS is the connection through conferences and events. So national, regional and specialty conferences. And uh, check these out. There's a lot that ACS provides aside from the science, such as career consulting. Uh, so just to show that, uh, just a little extra in case we all maybe aren't aware of this offering of virtual office hours here on the first Thursday of every month, Eastern time. Uh, and it's a great chance to network with your fellow participants, uh, the session moderators, <laughs> as well as get practical advice here in April on how to write a resume on the 7th, and then in May uh, about careers in the government on the 5th. And now I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. Today we'll be hearing from Dr. Isaiah Spate, who is an NIGMS postdoctoral fellow, the University of California, Irving. Um, so just some brief bio, the BS in chemistry came from Norfolk uh, State University. Later, he earned a PhD at Vanderbilt University, developing new mechanochemical methods for making inorganic and organometallic compounds. Third, uh, Dr. Spite is, Spate is an NIGMS postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, Irving focusing on the development of new technologies for amide reduction and bond formation. And last, he serves as the Western Regional Director for the National Organization for the Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. Uh, and with that, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Spate, and look forward to your talk. Um, and please uh, follow these guidelines and uh, we'd love to see your questions in the chat. With that, I think I will stop sharing. Or wait, do I share this as well? Maybe we'll come back to this. There's other things happening. Stay tuned for uh, after our Q and A to see. Wait, should I introduce it now? Yeah, I will. Sorry. Uh, just to <laughs> since we're going to stop recording, these are some upcoming events uh, in April. Uh, industrial chemists. Day in the Life series. There's diversity and inclusion uh, professional development workshop on the second and the ninth, and our day in the life in May will be a crystallographer. 
So check it out. And with that, please um, go for it, Dr. Spade. Thank you. Sweet. Well, thank you, uh, Nissa, for the really kind introduction. I'm super excited. Like when uh, Carissa, who I think just joined in, invited me to do this, uh, at first I was a little surprised. I said, okay, well, my, my days really aren't that cool. But the more that I thought about it, the more that I realized like my days are pretty interesting. And so I thought that I would have some fun with this. Um, so I know that the flyer said a day in the life of a synthetic chemist, but you know, I, I'm a, I'm a black chemist, so we kind of have to talk about what it's like to be a black chemist and uh, talk like this, because I can't I can't decouple day to day myself and and my race because unfortunately it's something that influences my day to day in a positive or in a negative way, and so I really wanted to just go ahead and showcase a little bit of that in this talk, title slide with the very obvious change of saying a black synthetic chemist, and in this picture you can see that I have uh, a couple of my mentors and now colleagues from undergrad that uh, have really been a driving force to my success to this day. Um, so I'll go ahead and just get us started. And so I, I wanna get, take you guys on a brief tour of where I've been and what I've done. And so of course the introduction really showcased all of that, but there are a couple of little things that I wanna toss in there too. Um, so I grew up in Portsmouth, Virginia. So that aeroport to that little small corner of Virginia that I have come to know and love. I went to a historically black high school in IC Norcom High School. Uh, my dad and my grandmother actually went to the same high school. Uh, and it actually what's funny about Norcom is that my parents, my, my father and my, and my grandmother, they went to a version of Norcom that was originally built in a different part of the city. And my dad showed me a video of him getting interviewed at the school. And it, it's, it's crazy how different things get. My dad went to school there, he had to apply to go to IC Norcom every year. So IC Norcom was envisioned as a, as a high level institution for technical training, science, arts, technology, all that kind of jazz. So over time things changed but Norcom still has a very near and dear place in my heart. And from there, I went from historically black high school to an historically black college of Norfolk State University where I got my BS. Uh, at Norfolk State, I was afforded a, a, a great opportunity through the Denemus program and so DENEMIS stands for uh, the Desorts National Institute for Mathematics and Applied Sciences. So through that program, I was able to get my bachelor's at no charge. And they also set me up for a lot of really awesome opportunities, which I'll talk about later on. But with DENEMIS and without Norfolk State, I wouldn't have been able to meet some of the people who led me on the path to go to Vanderbilt, which is smack dab in the middle of Tennessee, to get my PhD. Uh, and there I met some amazing people. I, I really found my community at Vanderbilt through a bunch of different channels, which we'll talk about soon. Um, but in the middle of that, I ended up doing some work abroad. And so I took a short trip up to Canada for a couple of months and did some research at McGill University with Thomas Law Frisch. Uh, and I had an amazing time there. So that was my first international experience was going up there and doing some ball milling to make moths, which I thought was the coolest thing ever. Um, after that, I came back, finished off the last couple of years of my PhD, and in the last portion of my PhD, I ended up meeting my current postdoc advisor, V. Dong, who brought me out to UCI. Uh, and so I've been here a little under a year. It'll be a year in May, which is crazy to think about all the things that have happened in less than a year in my life. Um, but it's, it's been amazing, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to come out here and learn and to meet so many different people. Um, but that's where we are now, and I kind of want to give a snapshot into where we're going. And so in May, I'm actually going to transition out of UCI to get back to mechanochemistry and go to uh, University of Cincinnati and do a short-lived postdoc for a year, maybe a year and a couple of months with uh, Professor James Mack. And from there forward, uh, I'll, I'll join some folks actually here on the call who I'm representing on my uh, to come to William and Mary to join their amazing faculty in the chemistry department, which I'm extremely excited for. Um, but that's kind of a tour of it doesn't really tell you too much about why I've done these things or who's helped me get there. And so I want to start from, from the very beginning of who really influenced me getting into chemistry. And that starts with my dad. Uh, my dad is a radiation therapist. He works at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital. My dad has always been a science junkie, whether it's chemistry, even though he claims he doesn't like chemistry that much, physics, biology, whatever it is, you name it, he loves it. Um, but my dad really got me into science. And when I was in when I was in elementary school, 
uh, my first science fair project wasn't a volcano or a potato plot. And so we actually made super saturated solutions and soaked sponges in them and grew crystals out of the sponges. And, and it was the coolest thing I ever did. We talked about the shapes, the colors, the sizes, how to change the crystal growth. And you would think it had helped me grow better crystals in grad school. Unfortunately, it hasn't. Um, but my dad was really the Kickstarter to my scientific exploration. And so that was just science in general. But as you narrow things down, they eventually meet on your way. And the first chemist that I met was actually uh, Shelly Mason. And so unfortunately, Shelly's no longer with us. Uh, she passed a couple of years ago to cancer. But Shelly was an amazing influence on me for chemistry. Uh, I took honors chemistry course in high school. And then I also took her AP course. And then she encouraged me to take the dual enrollment course. So I took three chemistry courses in high school before I even set foot on North campus. Um, but Shelly was extremely important to me because she showed me why chemistry was exciting, not just the fires and the explosions like every high school kids, but she showed me why it's important from a day-to-day -day perspective, from nutrition to energy to synthesis to all of these amazing facets that we know now, that I know now, uh, but they all start. So then after I left Norcom, uh, I got to, to Norfolk State and I met my first advisor, uh, Tina Hall. And, and Tina was the one who really helped rough, like smooth out my edges. Because I came to Norfolk State and I said, I, I've taken so much chemistry and everything's fine. And, you know, I probably won't start learning anything new until my sophomore year when I take organic. And Tina sat me down and pretty much told me, you still have so much to learn and such a long way to go. And she forced me to really put my head down and focus and go a lot further into this chemical space by doing a lot of different things. But the one that I give her the most credit for is helping me find my passion for mentorship and education. Because with Tina, she taught, she allowed me to serve with her as a, as a teaching assistant. And Norfolk State didn't actually have a formalized TA system for undergraduates. But with her help and with her inspiration, she allowed me to do this with her up until she retired, which was in the middle of my career at Norfolk State. And then from there, introduced me to uh, my last undergraduate advisor, uh, Tony Noweke. And so Tony... And I call him Tony just because that's how that's how close we've gotten over the years. But Tony was almost like a scientific uncle to me, uh, the one who was always on my head about being, you know, on time, being present for things, you know, not letting myself slip, pushing me with the hard questions, but also giving me a lot of life advice about where chemistry can take me and things that I'll experience in the rest of my career. But with these four people, it really set up a scaffold for me to find successful entities throughout the rest of my chemical career. And that's been found in grad school and postdoc, and even you know with the people with the folks at William and Mary, I feel like I found a great cohort to build with too. Uh, so just because of the foundation that these people have given me, I've been projected into a great space in chemistry. Um, but you know that that's those are the people who helped set up the the space that I worked in. But of course, like I said, I've been a couple of different places. So started at NSU, and from a research perspective, I've kind of been all over the place. I started working on polymer chemistry and as an undergrad during an REU experience. That was a short-lived experience. But then right after that, I went to Vanderbilt and did an REU uh, with Steve Townsend working on sugars. And, and that was my first experience in a graduate level lab and the way that he ran his group, how in tune his students were with, the, with chemical synthesis and all of the different ways they knew to make molecules really excited me. And so when I came back to NSU after that summer, I said, I wanna go to grad school and I wanna make sugars. And look, no, I go to grad school to make sugars because when I got there, I met Tim uh, and Tim got me excited about mechanochemistry. And we'll talk a little bit about why mechanochemistry and, and enthralled me so much. But after I met him, I was sold. But of course, I didn't really have a strong inorganic background because I did polymers and sugars. But the one piece of advice that I can give anybody here who's either in grad school, going to grad school, thinking about grad school and chemistry, try something different because you never know what's going to really captivate you and inspire you. And so Tim and I worked on a couple of projects individually. We worked on making some calcium compounds and we did some Grignard chemistry. And then after that, of course, I did my work with Tomislav where we made some moths and Tomislav and I have a sense of humor, so we come up with these really cheesy uh, <laughs> uh, graphical abstracts, which are fun. But towards the end, I really started finding my voice as an advocate for, for minority and marginalized scientists, especially Black chemists, 
through Novache and through some other channels. And uh, after an event happened during one of the closer summers to my end at Vanderbilt, I decided to speak up with some friends and some other colleagues. And we wrote an article called The Diverse View of Science to Catalyze Change, which was co-published in a couple of different journals. But that was my first multi national scale opportunity to really speak up for the people who I believe in, the people who I believe deserve a shot. And through that opportunity is what led me to meet V at UCI. And so we've done a couple of really interesting projects uh, here at UCI, both making amid bonds to make some really challenging compounds such as bubaricin, which we're knocking on the door of, but also to do some uh, interesting mental chemistry such as amide bond reduction, which we're collaborating with Jenny Yang on to make an electrochemical component. And then from there, we can take resources from biologically available feedstocks, such as amino acids, to make pyrazines, which I think are really cool molecules. But that's, that's my chemical background, right? And so you see I'm walking through this idea of how to build myself. And the reason I called myself a synthetic chemist is because I didn't just do organic chemistry or inorganic chemistry or organometallic chemistry. Really, if you hand me a molecule and say, can you make it? I'm going to say yes, just because I like making things and I don't really care what they are. And I think that's been the most fun part of my career is just being able to tackle different ideas, what chemistry can and can't be, and proving that anything can be made in any facet as long as you're creative enough. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about why mechanochemistry, because I think that that really is the is more exciting part of like the creativity of my career. When we think about doing chemistry, we think everything has to be dissolved and we think of solutions and you know, stirring flasks and separatory funnels and all this other kind of stuff, right? But why do we think of it that way? And that's because nature around us is always surrounded by solutions. Our planet is covered in water, our bodies are mostly water, and the percentages that make up each of these are very similar. So the idea of water has led us to chemistry being in solutions at all times. Even most biology is carried out in some aqueous based buffer system, right? So the idea of always having a solution around it drives us to think of chemistry as restricted to solutions. But not even just the idea of the planet and our bodies, but when you cook, you sometimes use water either to like boil rice or noodles for pasta and things of that nature. You drink water time. And then of course, when you have to use some kind of, you know, solutions to make your batters for cakes and things like that. And so the idea for solution-based anything is really always prevalent. So it pervades the idea of what chemistry can and can't be. But with all of these solutions, there's, there's a problem that comes in the chemical space and that's waste. And so if we take away anything scientific from up, I want you to remember these numbers. Uh, Industry, one of which is pharmaceutical manufacturing and the other is bulk chemical manufacturing. And the main takeaway is that pharma makes a lot of waste. A large portion of that is solvent waste, where a smaller portion of that is waste. And year to year, pharma has gotten a little bit better. So they've decreased the amount of solvent waste that they use, but they've increased the amount released. And then if we look at chemical manufacturing, of course, that's a larger piece of the pie. So they make a lot more waste. The percentages of solvent waste versus solid waste are different just because of the nature of the things that they do. But in terms of increasing and decreasing, their numbers aren't getting much better either. So we as chemists have to find ways to make chemistry a lot more green and environmentally. All of these numbers can mean anything or nothing to you. But the one thing I'll let you take away from this is this image of an Olympic swimming and knowing that pharma can fill this pool two thirds of the way full with what they release to the environment and the chemical manufacturing industry can fill that pool 55 times. So the next time you see an Olympic swimming pool, you can think, hey, chemistry is really screwing up on our environment and what can I do to help? And one of the easiest answers that I found was doing mechanochemistry. Here I have a couple of images of what a chemical reaction may or may not look like. And in the first two images, you can see that you have some kind of heating source and that heating source will then either pass your into a solvent or to its surroundings if it's open like this flask right here. If you do it in a microwave, it's closed off. So you lose a little bit less of that energy just because you don't have to worry so much about the surroundings. But in mechanochemistry, all the energy that you use goes straight to your reagents. And I thought that that was really amazing is just the fact that we can confine the energetics that we want to the system to go straight to the reagents instead of having to pass through some chemical middleman. Um, just a little bit of hardcore chemistry, right? If we think about doing this oxidation reaction of paratoluidine to make these diazo compounds, in terms of energy consumption, not even just from a waste perspective, but just running the actual 
this, ball milling is actually lower energy consumption than most other methods of chemistry. And so not only are we cutting back on solvent use and solvent waste, but we're also keeping the light bill low, which is also really nice for anybody, right? You write a grant and you head, you can probably tell your head because I'm not the one that's running the bills all the time. <laughs> so it's just something fun to think about when you think about how to do chemistry and what we can do. But mechanochemistry is interesting because it comes in a lot of different shapes, sizes, and styles. And so when I was in grad school, these were two of the mills that we used a lot in Tim's lab. The first one is a planetary mill. This planetary mill works by having a jar that sits on a sundial and rotates in a spinning motion, almost like our planet around the sun. And there are ball bearings and, and bang inside to create collisions that do chemistry. The other one that we use is a mixer mill. So this mixer mill shakes two jars on a holster and an bearing that collides with the surfaces to actually do the chemistry we want. Now, the question I get most how do you set one of these up? So I actually have a short video that shows how we do this. So pretty much just like in any lab, you weigh out all of your reagents, you get them all together, and we put them in these jars. So you can see these two small blue halves of a jar right here on this bench. And inside there are ball bearings. And so what we do is we seal these off, we put them in the holster like I showed in the video, close the safety door so that way nothing happens to anybody. And then we just let them run. And for some of these reactions, we could do them at really low energy and some of them we have high energy. But the good thing about mechanochemistry is that since all of your reagents are so close together, these reactions are really fast. So as you can see, there was an immediate color change in this reaction from orange and white to blue. That reaction was in five minutes. And there are other systems that are just as fast that are a little bit more complex. But the beauty of it is that I don't have to sit and wait for five, seven, eight hours, multiple days to do chemistry. I can get things done in minutes or hours. I really have to push. Uh, so we talked a little bit about mechanochemistry and, and my background in mechanochemistry goes in a lot of different directions. Uh, one of which, like I talked about, was making calcium bases via mechanochemistry. I talked a little bit about moth chemistry with Tomislav, which was a great experience. And we actually got a, I got the idea for from my art major at Norfolk State. And so hanging around with art people makes you get a little bit more creative and create uh, in terms of imagery. So shouts out to her for talking about her art homework whenever we're home for the holidays. Um, did some Grignard chemistry with Tim, which I thought was a really interesting study about how to break CF bonds, which are typically looked at as inert. Um, but then I've also done some stuff in education. And so we had a running collaboration with a former grad student in the group, Nick Boyd, who's now a professor at University, uh, University of Science and Arts at Oklahoma. And that reaction I showed you in the video is one we actually developed for a undergraduate class for general chemistry students to perform redox reactions on ferrocene and really be able to understand the physical properties that go into reactions, not just the chemical properties. And then the last thing I did while I was in grad school is worked on making some new ligands for our group. And uh, that project is being followed up right now by Henry de Groot, uh, who has really taken a different perspective than I had on the project and has really brought the idea full circle and I, I'm excited to see what he does with the work that I left behind. Uh, but all of that's mechanochemistry. And then, of course, I came out to, to work with V. And we've done a lot of really interesting things, too. So we've been working on making this buvericin compound that I've shown here. We've also been interested in doing some ring expansion chemistry using photochemistry to make strained uh, uh, amino acids. And then as of late, like I mentioned, we've been interested in doing electrochemistry. And so we're working with the Yang group to try to develop some new environmentally friendly methods for reducing amides to amines. And that's been a really fun collaboration with both Jenny and my friend Alyssa, who's been doing some amazing work in that group. But all of this stuff is in solution. And so you, you can't take the solid state chemist out of me. So when we took group photos, I actually took a picture with a hammer, which is a old school rollback to what we used to use as the mechanochemistry symbol in some of Tim's older papers. Um, but with all of that, you know, that leads me to where I am now and where I'm headed. And so when I get to William and Mary, I've got some really exciting ideas. And so I'm, I'm super thankful. So shout out to them. They actually put together a, a small watch party on campus. So shouts to you guys for being here. And I'm super excited. And so you'll get a sneak peek of what I'm going to bring. Of course, there's going to be a research component. We're going to get back into mechanochemistry. 
doing a little bit of mechanocatalysis, also doing some printing, which I think is going to be really cool. And one of the other aspects is going to be augmented reality learning tools for my students to develop for students to use. Uh, additionally, we'll do some professional development in the group, it's like designing LinkedIn pages, CVs, opportunities. And I also want to give them some out some other opportunities outside of William and Mary through programs such as Leadership Alliance, which were instrumental for me as an undergraduate student. And additionally, there's always the service and outreach component. And so, of course, I'm a big proponent of Nobiche. I'm a big proponent of ACS, SACNIS, and these other groups. And so I bring them to the forefront. Like William & Mary already has a hyperactive Nobiche chapter, so hats off to you guys. Uh, but bringing some of these other facets to the, to the uh, campus would be great. And so uh, I, I just can't wait to join you. Uh, like you guys made it in my time. I haven't even started yet, so I'm excited. Um, but the real question, of course, I had it in my title is, well, I got part, right? Like you said, this is going to be about a black chemist and this all really kind of just seems like a chemist. And so we have to talk about some of the things that I've experienced and how they've helped mold me to get to where I am. And so I'm only going to talk about a few of these because I don't want this talk to be grim or heavy or, or downing. I really want this to be a talk of joy and excitement, but we have to show where I was to show where I am. And so I've experienced a couple of things as a black chemist that range from microaggressions, such as comments like, it'd be nice like, for someone like you, someone that looks like you to come in and say, I'm the scientist. And this came on the back end of a conversation about looking at primarily black schools within the Nashville area. And, and I was extremely hurt by this because why does, why does someone that looks like me have to be the scientist? Why can't I just, why can't all of us just look like scientists? Why can't we all just be a part of this scientific community without having to look a certain or feel a certain way. Additionally, I got other comments that stepped a lot more away from the science, such as you look clean now when getting a haircut after growing my hair for a while. So you experience some things that make you feel uncomfortable and make you feel like you don't really belong in the area. And then you also get some things such as direct racism. So I, I won't show this image for long because again, I don't want to get too heavy on things. But when you see flyers like this get printed randomly from the printer in your lab, 12 times <laughs> over an hour in multiples of three and 15 minute intervals, you kind of get discouraged. And, and it, made, it made things hard over the course of the last couple of years, experiencing these things and, and questioning whether I really belonged in chemistry. But to get past this, the best solution is community. And, and I heard it all the time as a, as a child, it takes a village to raise a child, but it takes a community to build a chemist. Uh, and so I've really found some awesome opportunities throughout my career to really build myself and to build up others who may be experiencing some of the things that I've seen. Uh, so one of them was, was OBGAPS. So Vanderbilt has uh, an organization that's called the Organization for Black Graduate and Professional Students. And OBGAPS was my first taste of community at Vanderbilt. I went to one of their events and the first one that we had was how to interact with police in your community. And we actually talked to Vanderbilt PD about the things that they've seen, how we interact with each other, how we can learn from each other from a community standpoint to an to a, a, a official standpoint. And we really had an open dialogue about things that you may or may not experience and how they're learning to be better so that way these things don't happen anymore. So I thought that was an awesome opportunity that OBGAPS put on. And I'm really shouting out OBGAPS because it influenced my friend group because one of my best friends, Logan Northcutt, is actually the current president of OBGAPS, and he's been driving some really awesome initiatives there, too. Uh, outside of OBGAPS, there's IMSD, which is the initiative for maximizing student diversity, which was at Vanderbilt. And IMSD was awesome. Uh, they're normally coupled to the uh, quantitative chemical biology program, which I didn't go through, but they invited anyone from any program to be a part of their activities. And <laughs> actually, the former director of the program, uh, Christina Keaton Williams, was really instrumental in getting me involved. She told me, I know you're busy and you got things you got to do with chemistry, but I need to see you at one of our events every semester. And I said, okay, I can do that. And so with that, and with that drive to build a community for me, and it's not just black students, but it's all students of all races and creeds, it helped me find my footing in a space I actually had a footing or not. And then of course, outside of these, Nobiche has been an extremely huge component of my career. Uh, going from starting the Nashville area chapter, which encompasses Vanderbilt, Fisk, TSU, and Meharry, all different students from all different scientific backgrounds, 
moving from there to building into the role of national student rep, which introduced me to people literally from end to end of the, of the continent, and then moving into Western chair, which has expanded my connections on the professional level, as well as being able to give opportunities to students, Nobish has been a huge part of my career. And I can't thank them and the community enough for helping me get to where I am. I've met amazing friends through Nobiche. I found great opportunities for my career through Nobiche. So this is my shameless Nobiche plug. If you're already and you're interested, reach out to me and we'll make that happen. But what do my days really look like? So I'll, I'll kind of tail things off here so that we have more than enough time for questions. It's asked for a day in the life. So what does my day look like? Well, of course, as a chemist, I'm running reactions, I'm purifying and analyzing things, you know, running new experiments, planning new experiments, taking time to read the literature. So every once in a while, I'll scroll through the ASAPs of different journals. And of course, since I'm a synthetic chemist, the journals range anywhere from crystal growth and design all the way to green chemistry, to JOC, Angavant, you know, ChemSci, all of these different journals. Even sometimes I'll poke around in a Canadian Journal of Chemistry because they've got some really interesting stuff too. Uh, and then I'm also discussing ideas with my lab mates because you, you always want to be in an environment where you're encouraged to talk ideas and to learn from each other. And I think that my group now that I'm with does that really, really well. Additionally, you know, there's mentoring students. So I'm currently mentoring uh, Barry Yang, who's an undergrad in our group, who's uh, actually on his way to grad school at the end of this quarter, well, in the next quarter. And I'm super excited to see what he accomplishes in his personal career. But also V has given me the opportunity to prepare myself at William & Mary uh, to do some mentoring of all of our undergraduate students. So I kind of just walk around and check in on them and make sure that everything's upright. And I'll also check in with the graduate students to see if there's anything that they may want me to talk to them about that they just don't feel comfortable having that conversation with. So it's allowed me an opportunity to really step into a larger mentorship role and almost running like a micro group, even though the grad students are the one that design the experiments and drive them. But of course, there's the other side of things too, which is no biche stuff. <laughs> I've talked a lot about them. And as you can see, they're super integral to my career. Uh, answering emails, handling business, you know, meetings with other officials of the organization, meetings with chapters, really getting more people involved and invested and really trying to drum up our presence out here in the West. But it's also preparing for my next career step. So this bullet point would have looked a little bit differently a couple of months ago, and it probably would have said, preparing for interviews and updating documents. But now that all of that said and done and I know where I am, we're doing a couple of different things. I've been meeting with uh, Professor Mack to talk about my role in his group and how that's gonna look over the next couple of months. And also just touching base with the folks over at William & Mary, popping in for faculty meetings when I can, getting advice from the faculty there about how to be successful in my career and really just expanding my pool not prepare that first step into my independent career. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop here with all the technical stuff and me rambling on about my life and my day to day and open it up for questions. But anyone who's here, feel free to contact me any way you like. If you have a more personal chemistry question, reach out to me through the UCI email. If you have a Nobiche question, you can reach me at westregion at nobiche.org. If you want to just connect on Twitter, you can follow me here. Or if you're interested in connecting on LinkedIn, if Twitter's not so much your speed, then my LinkedIn's there too. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and open up the floor for questions if anyone has any. And thanks for your time. I'm really appreciative of having this opportunity. Thank you so much for that excellent talk. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and then we'll transition into the questions. So here I go. Stop.